You're listening to Everyday Engineering, the City of Madison's engineering podcast where we talk about infrastructure. Complex topics explained simply. From the water that flows down your drain to the rain and snow that drains into the lakes. By way, the curbs and streets we design. City engineering touches your life in so many ways. Explained right now in Everyday Engineering. A green roof or living roof is a roof of a building that is partially or completely covered with vegetation and a growing medium. Plants on the roof or garden on the roof, if you picture it in your head, not only does it look kind of cool, it helps pollinators and holds back rainwater. They're also an option as the city is updating its stormwater ordinance for developers. And today, don't worry, we're going to cover it all and break it all down for you. My name is Hannah Molinitsky, City of Madison Engineering Division Public Information Officer. Today, I'm joined by Engineering's Principal Architect in our Facilities Section, Brian Cooper, and Engineering's Stormwater Section Manager and Principal Engineer, Janet Schmidt. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this is going to be cool. Green roofs. Roofs, roughs, however you want to say it and however you want to listen to it at home. Uh, Let's get started with both of you, kind of getting to know both of you. Kind of explain your role here in engineering for our listeners. Janet, maybe you kick us off. Sure. So I'm Janet Schmidt. I'm the principal engineer for the stormwater section. Um, And our section deals with stormwater quality, flooding concerns. Um, We're working on our ordinance uh, updates. And then we also been doing a large watershed study initiative. And I'm Brian Cooper. I'm a principal architect in the facilities section of engineering. Um, And we do projects sort of ranging from very small, uh, maybe a bathroom remodel, up to major development projects, uh, such as like the Central Library or the Madison Municipal Building or the Penny Library that's coming online soon. And um, we oversee generally on those bigger projects, we act kind of like a developer in the design and overseeing the design and construction of those facilities. Hopefully by people listening to this, they'll know a little bit more about what engineering does and how many different sections. I mean, we have so many different sections of what we do. We don't just build streets and paths and sidewalks. We do storm and facilities and everything else. So um, thank you for explaining that. So before we get to the stormwater ordinance, uh, let's start with and how green roofs fit into that. Let's establish green roofs, how we're using them. Brian, we have about four right now on city buildings, correct? Yeah, we have, uh, we have roughly four um, that engineering's overseen, but there's also uh, one on a parks facility that we're aware of, and then also um, water utility operations. So um, some of the bigger ones are, are on uh, facilities that uh, engineering's overseen. So what are they? I mean, it, it's like a garden on a roof, right? In a way, if we're thinking about it that way. That's how I think of it, but maybe from a more architectural standpoint, you can kind of explain what are they? Yes, I, I think from, um, you know, the term is green roof, but essentially it's a living roof. Um, so it's either partially or fully covered by a vegetative material. And then um, generally what it, uh, kind of going from top down, it's uh, sort of the vegetation, some sort of soil uh, or growing medium. Um, sometimes there's a tray system that holds both of those things. And then underneath that, you generally have a root barrier or a root barrier. <laughs> and also um, uh, a drainage layer for water. And then also um, a protection layer that goes between that system and the actual waterproofing membrane. Hmm. And so um, under that heading of green roofs, uh, there's usually two uh, types of roof. There's an extensive roof and an intensive roof. Uh, I'm not sure who came up with those terms, but <laughs> an extensive roof is a more of a uh, lightweight tray system uh, that's probably six inches or less in height. Um, it is uh, usually lower maintenance, and it is um, uh, kind of one you probably see more often than the intensive uh, green roof. Uh, the intensive green roof is usually six inches or more of soil material, usually quite a bit more heavy, and um, may look more like your backyard yard in terms of the maintenance it's going to need and the irrigation it's going to, going to be required. And in this, I, I'm confirming with you right now, live or recorded, um, first, of, first of all the green roofs at the city were engineering six, at 1600 Emil Street Operations Building, correct? 
Yeah, that's my understanding. I mean, it's a little before my time, but the, it's the Larry D. Nelson Engineering Operations Facility. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that was the first uh, green roof that the city pursued. And uh, that was back in 2006, so quite a few years ago now. And the um, that has a combination of both the extensive green roof system as well as the intensive green roof system. Why do we use these? Why do we put these on our buildings? I guess, can you kind of share the thought process behind that? Yeah, I, I can. Um, uh, <laughs> I, you know, architects are stereotypically in the aesthetic realm, so I'll sort of continue the stereotype, and then maybe Janet can weigh in on the more... Um, some of the, the some of the uh, more engineering side of items, but of, of the green roofs. But uh, for generally, uh, the city has been a sort of early adopter in green building certification. So I think that's one of the big issues that has pushed uh, green roofs on city facilities. Um, namely, that uh, there's a point system associated with these green building certification programs and. Uh, in the case of green roofs, you do get some uh, value out of that uh, uh, rating system based on dealing with stormwater on your uh, particular site that you're on or the building that you have. So, however, there's, uh, we like to pursue them, I guess, from an architectural standpoint because they are an amenity for uh, either the staff that work in the building, other folks that are in neighboring buildings that can see the green roof. Um, they're usually aesthetically very beautiful. Um, if there is an outdoor component that you can access as, a, as, a, as an occupant of the building, it offers a nice amenity for you to you know, enjoy uh, a garden in an area that uh, may not otherwise be in the area. Um, we also, um, from uh, our own facilities viewpoint, uh, we see them as a way to sort of, an, they are, expen they are a, an added cost up front and sometimes potentially expensive, but they do have the op uh, there is the opportunity of them extending the roof life uh, mm -hmm. for our projects wow which is a benefit yes yeah. and we can have lunches in the garden on the roof if it's possible that's what we we have that option at emil street which is yeah. shout out to our emil friends um so yes they look cool they can help architecturally also, but from a stormwater perspective, there's some major benefits to this as well. Yes, there are. So from a stormwater perspective, we talk about peak runoff and volume control. So peak runoff, think of that as how fast water actually leaves the surface. So on a typical roof with uh, no improvements, if it's sloped, the, that water would run off really quickly. Um, it's always gonna run off, um, and it just depends on how fast it's gonna get there. Volume control is more controlling the amount of water that actually leaves and actually gets its way into the receiving bodies. So that would be like the storm sewer as it drains to the lakes or the rivers. Um, so green roofs actually have benefits for both of these. Um, they're set up so that they will detain the water so that will reduce the peak and how fast it gets into the system. And that helps from a, a flash flooding standpoint. Um, but for areas in the isthmus in particular, in Madison, where we have lakes, we're surrounded by lakes downtown, um, the volume control is also important, too, because we have um, issues with the amount of water actually getting into the lakes and raising up the levels that also cause flooding. So um, from an engineering standpoint, um, these are two really important um, issues that we're looking at for flood mitigation. But there's also stormwater quality benefits for, for these two. So it helps us uh, with our um, EPA permit for the Clean Water Act that we have to abide by and helps us meet our goals for stormwater quality as well. So it's really a good way to hold back some of the water or at least control a little bit from what is running off when it rains. Uh, That's right. So in, in simple terms. Yes, yeah. It's, um, uh, we talk about it and people refer to it as a sponge. So think of it as the water being wicked up um, and into the plants, it, uh, the plants use it, so there's multiple benefits and then it can uh, evapotranspirate out of those plants so it actually doesn't um, enter the, the water bodies at all. So it is a, it is a big benefit for the stormwater uh, system. It, does it get heavy? I think maybe, Brian, you can hit on this a little bit. I know we were going to talk about it a little bit later, but it gets kind of heavy on the roof if it holds a lot of water, right? Yeah, I mean, generally the, the growing medium uh, media they, that they try to use is um, will hold some water, but I think it's also sort of designed to, be, um, to allow um, so that it's not in, containing so much water that it gets overwhelming to the roof system. So um, 
back to the extensive versus intensive, the extensive, more shallow roof system is going to weigh somewhere between 15 and 50, uh, 50 pounds per square foot, depending on the design. And then your more intensive green roofs, the more deeper uh, soil-based roofs, um, those could get up to uh, 150 pounds per square foot, depending on how much soil you have on the surface. So um, you can get quite a bit uh, of heft uh, up there, depending on the situation. But of course, you build for it. You when you when you build for a green roof, you build for it and the weight and the support for it. Yeah, absolutely. When you, uh, of course, when you make a selection for a green roof in your project you you of course need to design the structure to support that as well so um so back to the storm water so obviously storm water and runoff and where water flows like you were mentioning janet is a topic especially in our area people are having and always having in engineering but let's talk a little bit about uh the upcoming storm water ordinance impacting developers and how green roofs may play a part so First, what is happening with the stormwater ordinance and why are we working on updating it? Right, so um, I'll give you the why first. So um, in Madison area, we've received a lot of heavy rainfall. Um, we've also been working with uh, folks down at the UW on climate change issues. So we're, we're understanding a little bit more that there's a need to update our, our requirements to help with this flood mitigation effort that we've been uh, dealing with for the last several years. Um, so as far as where we're at, uh, we've kicked off our public informational meetings. We're gaining input from, from folks and we have our proposed ordinance, which is also found on our website, that talks about the changes to the code that we're trying to make to help uh, mitigate some of these issues. So um, that process will go on for probably another month and a half, and then we're hoping to get uh, information introduced to the, to the elected officials uh, for approvals probably around May. Sure, and the why, you know, the, yes, there's more rain, but we also want a way to um, kind of, I guess, control what stormwater infrastructure is in place to support, even if it's private developers or redevelopers. Correct, so um, I'll give you a, for instance, um, the, again, I'll go back to the isthmus. Uh, so, Folks that are familiar with how Madison developed, that was a wetland that had been filled over time. So some of those natural um, stormwater management type systems that were in place by nature um, had been filled in and taken away. So as we develop out and we put all these impervious surfaces out there, um, the water just runs off fast. And the isthmus being what it is has very high ground water levels as well. So some of our typical uh, green infrastructure and infiltration methods just don't work um, for a variety of different reasons, but high ground wa water or even contaminated water um, is a, a factor that, that does that. Um, so green roofs are a good solution for, for being able to uh, store the water um, and, and actually reduce the volume of water that reaches our lakes. And then what are some other green infrastructure options, I guess, for um, you know, anybody who's developing or redeveloping or, you know, green roofs are just one. Sure. Um, so there's options, and again, it's going to depend on where the site is located and what the limitations are. But some of the options we have would be water reuse. So that could be something um, where they're uh, maybe treating the water and reusing it for um, non-potable uh, reasons, such as uh, car wash or, or maybe um, flushing toilets or things like that. Um, there's uh, bioswales, uh, that would be more of an infiltration, so depending again where you're located, that may or may not be an option. Um, some of the cooler things that we see are um, the rain planters, where the, the water just discharges right from, the, from your gutters into a planter, um, and that, that could be almost thought of as maybe a mini uh, green roof. And then of course we have rain gardens and those sort of things, um, pervious pavements. Um, and the more standard green infrastructure that we see around town. All these things, hopefully whoever's listening is learning a bunch of new things because I learn something new every single day working in engineering. Anything else about the stormwater ordinance? Um, if you're listening to this, it is posted on the engineering website and we are taking comments and feedback on the changes until April 10th of 2020. So if you're listening to this past that, take a look at the ordinance because by then we will have the updated form of it. It's been a while since we've updated it, correct? Yes, or? it has. It's time. It's time. Yeah, yeah. things change 
enough. And we see that changing at, you know, higher levels of government as well. So we just have to, you know, get with the times and, and change our ordinance as well. What else do we want to talk about? Oh, yeah, the cost of <laughs> green roofs. Uh, can we kind of hit on that a little bit? I guess, you know, if developers are thinking of it, redevelopers, if people, uh, residents, I, I don't know, whoever wants a green roof, can you kind of talk about the cost just a little bit? Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is uh, one of the issues. Of course, you got to take into account when uh, you're working on a building. Any component, you know, of a building has costs, and uh, green roofs are no exception. Um, <laughs> we talked a little earlier about there is a benefit uh, to having a green roof because it helps extend the life of of your roof, and maybe you don't have to replace it quite as often. But uh, if you are considering a green roof, uh, particularly um, uh, the, the intensive or the more heavy green roof, uh, you really need to take a look at uh, your structural needs for that. It, uh, often on city buildings, we're reusing existing buildings, and sometimes they just don't have the capacity to carry any type of green roof without additional structure. So in those instances, we have to either decide to you know, spend the additional cost to do that or try to find other ways to deal with sort of storm management issues. Uh, another kind of maybe indirect cost is if indeed you want to try to occupy a, a roof area with, you know, with humans, uh, <laughs> you have to follow all the life safety issues that you might see if it was a room in a building. So you've got to pretend like, or not pretend, you have to act as if it's a room. So you'll have to take into account issues like how many people can be on the roof? How many exits do you need? How do you access that space? How do you get out of that space in the event of an emergency via you know, fire alarm and or uh, exit lighting? So there's some what I would call sort of direct indirect costs. And then there's just the cost of the green roof materials themselves. And so not including the waterproofing membrane, um, we're seeing estimates and even real costs for an extensive green roof around $25 per square foot. And uh, more intensive green roofs we're seeing estimated at around $40 per square foot. Of course, every situation is different, and you would have to take that into account when you're designing your facility. Okay, so what I'm gathering from this conversation, if you're learning or remembering anything, you can't just go home and plant a garden on your roof. Uh, that We do not want that. You have to make sure that you have all the safety precautions, all the planning, the weight planning. Um, and then if this is something that you're thinking of from a developer's perspective, make sure you're checking out the stormwater ordinance. Make sure you're checking in with the city um, on all of the things, because it's not simple but it is a cool option for people, um, especially when they want it to A, look great, and B, maybe help our stormwater infrastructure. Thank you both for coming. This was great, good conversation, really interesting. People always take interesting green roofs. So if anybody has any other ideas or questions about these topics, click over to our City of Madison Engineering Facebook page or Twitter, because we're here for you as a resource every day in engineering. <laughs>